and Nicholas Roy. Let's give him a round of applause, guys. And now, I bid you. It's all you. It's all you. Yeah. Wherever you feel like you want to get a shot. I'm going to do it. Fire Emblem slash Apex Legends battle. <laughs> Come on, Seba, use your head. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, Nicholas, are you on it too? All right, I'll scoot over. <laughs> Yesterday this happened too, and we, we they got a microphone and brought it over here. There we go. The goal is to not say anything. So Chris always comes through. Right. Yeah. So How's it going? Do you have sunglasses? We decided we're all going to wear sunglasses. You weren't on mic. It's okay. <laughs> it's cable. It's Netflix. It's streaming. You can see what I want, right? I would love to do a reverse panel today where we just ask you guys stuff. I would love that too. How many of you guys are responsible for my Choose Your Legend win as Tiki? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's so lovely to be friends. Aww. I waited so long for a change of outfit. And then, well, it just looked the same, didn't it? <laughs> I feel like they changed the buttons in a zipper. <laughs> um, there's a little bit of feedback on this mic. Is there anyone on sound? No. no? Where's the sound? Yeah, okay. I'll, it's, it's right on the edge. Right on the edge. And if you're far away, I don't know if it makes it better. Or worse. Sunglass uh, thing happens. Nick started it. <laughs> <laughs> Some mellow walking up their glasses. <laughs> well, I didn't have anywhere else to put him. <laughs> I was sleeping for so very long, and uh, <laughs> tell me about your character. Um, Octane and Apex Legends? Or Leaf? Fire Emblem, yeah. Um, is everybody um, really here for Fire Emblem? Is that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I, I actually started in, in, in the Fire Emblem franchise a while back. I started with, uh, I think my first character was Rowan in Fire Emblem Warriors, and then I was Soth as well, and uh, also Leaf. So, um, yeah, it's pretty At first great. you don't succeed, try and right. try again. That's right. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, I've been blessed to, it's kind of a gift that keeps giving, um, you know, working with, with Nintendo on this and being brought back so many times. And um, yeah, I, um, I don't know, just leave the questions to you guys, but. Uh, what about your character? Um, so I'm brand new to the Fire Emblem world. Um, my first thing was, what's the what's the name of the, this is how new I am. What's the name of the mobile game? There's the mobile game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, was, I I that was my intro. I was Noel in that, and then I moved to Fire Emblem Engage, and I played Zelkov in that. Who I just really love Zelkov. Like he's such a kooky guy. Um, yeah, he's very, yeah, let me see. He has a thing, he has this, this, I don't know what you'd call it, a tick or something where he always chooses a word in the sentence to emphasize. So we had a ton of time, uh, of such a great time. The writer um, had identified what words those would be, but um, I worked with Patrick most of the time. Uh, and uh, he, he's so lovely, but we would just, you know, massage that, choose different words, it worked better, but yeah, anyway, it was um, such a blast. Patrick Science is an amazing He director. is amazing, yeah. he is. Um, the weird thing too is that, you know, in My Hero, he and I have a bit of a conflictory relationship, character-wise, but he's like the sweetest guy and so awesome to be directed by him, but yeah, anyway. We're moderating this panel, right? We are. We are. Right on. Right on. Yes. Okay. Oh, you mean you're going to go okay. ask the questions? Okay, great, great. Um, so, how did you get started in voice acting? Um, so, I was a kid. Yeah. You know, I studied acting and uh, started doing it, but I, I found my feet like in, in stage, and then in college, I was like, you know what? I really want to do this with my life. How do I diversify? My my talent, so to speak. How can I create more opportunities for myself? So made a demo, 
um, and started doing some commercial stuff, and then got an audition for an anime. Um, it was called Orphan. It was a long time ago. And oh, wow, okay. thank you. It was a lead role, uh, and that was the first. Wait, hold on, so are yes. we bothering you then? Nope. Did you just check your messages? Do we just need it? A... Uh, there's no signal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do it, do it. I haven't had a second of time, but I need to I haven't I know. My nan called me, you guys, about two hours ago, and she was just like, you didn't call me back yesterday. And I said, well, I'm in Connecticut, and I'm signing autographs. And she was like on the speaker, and then all of a sudden started laying into me while I was signing autographs. Well, I'm your nan. <laughs> And she's like, you didn't call me, and I didn't know if you were okay. She's in Connecticut, but they have phones in Connecticut. <laughs> 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 and I'm just there, and the people are like, I, I said, I'm sorry, they're like, no, 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 no. She doesn't really sound like that, but she sounded really good as Kiki Mora. Um, <laughs> um, how did you get started in voice acting? Um, I, I guess the short version of it is, uh, you know, I studied uh, theater in college, and um, just knew I wanted to either perform in theater or be on camera um, in movies and TV. And this was at the University of New Orleans. I, I grew up in uh, the south of Louisiana. And so, yeah, I loved, loved being there. It was definitely conducive to being an artist uh, living living out there near the French Quarter in those those areas. Um, Drunk being conducive to being an artist. artist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drunk yeah. artist, you know. We're all in the sunglasses. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no but, alcohol uh, was had. The, 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 the gist of it was I you know, I graduated um, in theater, and um, being in New Orleans, we actually had talent agencies out there. So uh, I started getting little one-liners and big Hollywood movies that would come out to Louisiana, and um, got some tiny little parts and made a little bit of money. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, I did a... Uh, a little bit part in a Cuba Gooding Jr. movie out there. I did a, a bit part in a, in a Double Jeopardy with Ashley Judd. Um, I did a little one-liner in Crazy in Alabama that Antonio Banderas was directing. And so that kind of was like, I was, I was in college. I was, I was getting these little you know parts. And uh, so I was like, man, I think I'm going to maybe just move to Hollywood or whatever. And so I did. Once I graduated, I had an agent that actually made a phone call to an agent, a small agency in LA and got me a meeting. I arrived uh, to Los Angeles. I took this meeting. They said, yeah, we'll represent you. Um, I started getting sent out for TV shows. And then the gist of it is, um, after a number of years doing that, my agent called me one day and asked if I was interested in doing voiceover work, that they um, worked with an affiliate voiceover agency that was looking for bilingual talent. And I said, yeah, I'll do whatever. I need to make some money. you know. So I wasn't, I wasn't making a whole lot of money. And, um, so they sent me over to this voiceover agency. And literally for the first year, they were just reading me for Spanish commercials. So everything I auditioned for was a Spanish commercial. And about a year in, I said, hey, you think I should I could read for some English commercials too? Some English speaking stuff? <laughs> like, yeah, sure, sure. speak English, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, but it was a good thing because it, it got me making money pretty fast. Um, I got my very first job. It was a yes. Fire Hot Cheetos commercial or whatever. And uh, I got past my very first time going and walking into that voiceover agency. Um, and so that did kind of like solidify that I could do it. Um, and then, yeah, next thing I know, a couple years later, I was uh, getting cast in some video games. And then I got my first anime. And uh, I got my first uh, Nickelodeon animated series. And it just kept kind of going. I just I was like, man, I'm making more money in this than I've ever, yeah. I ever did. I think I'll just stay on this track. And from there, um, you know, looking back now, that was... Um, I've had like a 15 year run now, so. It's just crazy when you set out as an actor too. You, 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 it never goes the way that, I mean, that's how yeah. life is. Yeah. Yeah. It just never goes the way you envision it, but. Absolutely not. It's, it's, yeah. it's all what about you? Well, like how, how did you get started? You know, some people have skeletons in their closet. Mine is that I do have a Bachelor of Fine Arts, so I was the outstanding Fine Arts graduate for my class. Hell yeah. And then I went and did disaster relief and was getting ready to go to law school. Wow. Um, but I had about $80,000 in student loans, and I wanted to go to law school and not have to work. So I just thought I'd, I'd rather pay off some of these student loans first. Right. Because I know $80,000 does not seem like a lot, <laughs> but I was like, and now it's Two. another 100000 to go to school. I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Right. And so I was a, a maid for a Malibu maid service. Um, I parked cars for valet with the dolls. I uh, did catering, and sometimes I was lucky enough because um, I took this one class for voiceover where every 
weekend, they kind of gave you a sample. And the last weekend of the four weekends, there was an agent, agent's night. And I mean, like the eight-year-old inside of me was like, I could get discovered. And I did. And my first Whoa. audition was for Teresa the Brown Hair Barbie. And they paid me like three grand to be like, this is a great house. And I was like, oh my gosh, I would pay these student loans off so fast. <laughs> and I got um, a couple of animes and you know, some of my acting friends, they were like, oh, it's only $65 an hour. We don't do that. And I was like, if you're scrubbing toilets in the stars for twelve fifty, right. $65 an hour. I don't know where All you guys are from. It was yeah. like, and they feed you. Um, and sometimes I'd go to Bang Zoom and they'd be like, well, we're just going to throw this food out. you know. And I'm still like basically starving college kind of the mentality now. You just throw it out, do you want it? And I'm like, uh, truffle mac and cheese? Yeah. So I'm eating. Can I have the whole tray? <laughs> I was so shameless. I was like, this fruit looks like it's going to go bad. I would say that. And they're like, did you want the bowl of fruit? And I'm like, <laughs> I, I had a friend that when we would go to like in school, he would bring Tupperware to like different events and just literally, oh, really? We're throwing this out to go. Like, right. his own Tupperware. Guys, right. you can only eat so much ramen. Right. Or like the three for a dollar burritos. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to be able to pay off my student loans. And I kept booking a little bit more, but um, I was also, then I got a job at an investment banking firm. So then I was really going to pay off my student loans. And so I still did a little bit of voiceover, but I realized, I mean, it's like being a professional dodgeball player. Who's a real professional voice actor? Like in my circle and my family is doctors, lawyers, scientists. So I thought, well, it was a good run, you know. So and you're, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, yeah. you. So wait, your yeah. your bachelor's is in acting? It is, yeah. but like, I might as well, like, did your, did that your was family, was your family like, no, what no, are you were, doing? Yes, that's exactly what <laughs> happened. Like, please go to law school. Yeah. And then I just thought, well, okay, I, I booked Reem Tosaka and then Yuki Cross for Vampire Night. And I thought, and then I got a publishing deal to write music. And I had lost my job at the bank, and I thought, well, I'm just going to see where this goes. And it's Here we are. still going. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to law school. And just recently, like in the last year and a half, my mother was like, well, congratulations! It, looks, it says here that you you booked a role, and like it suddenly occurred to her that I'm actually a voice actress, but not like a starving voice actress, you know? Because she would just see me and be like, "Here's twenty dollars." <laughs> Are you? <laughs> She'd like slip it in my pocket, like, "Good luck with that." <laughs> make it make money. Yes, um, you know, it's a little bit of a disappointment, and um, but then, guys. Like when these are your friends you get to work with, I feel like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I'm like a big Raw Doll fan. You know where they there's no more golden tickets, but they just buy the chocolate bar because it's fun. You know, I wasn't gonna be famous, um, but then they get the last golden ticket, uh, Grandpa and Charlie, and I feel like I got a golden ticket and ended up being in. You know, when I decided to kind of focus on it, like this little game, Apex Legends, Mortal Kombat, Marvel Avengers, Black Panther's Quest, and. I'm still pinching myself, and I want to Betty White this. I want to be like 98 oh, yeah, yeah. and still working. I'm like, got some jobs for me. <laughs> no retiring this business. Yeah, no, no, I'm no so need. grateful. And guys, every I was like, all of us up here, all three of us, um, we're so grateful to you because the fans of anime and games have changed the planet. It's really true. I was just talking to somebody about this this morning. Yeah. We owe our lives to you. This is yeah. like some tear in the universe. I mean, I see and we get to do this. My first anime was like 20 years ago, and to see what, how this business has changed and what it's become since then, you know, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Um, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know, it wasn't until I went to my first, I didn't do conventions at the beginning of my voice career at all, like I was doing other things, I was still doing a lot of theater, and I didn't have the schedule to do it. And when I went to my friend, you know how it is in our jobs, we work alone, you know, you're just not with a lot of people all the time, and you don't always know what, how, especially before social media and stuff, how people are responding to the work, and when I went to my first convention, I was just floored, I was like, I had this show that I thought was just some small little thing people cared about, and it helped them, you know? so yeah, you guys are the reason we're here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, guys. Um, 
Um, Does anybody want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you want to ask questions? Yeah. How about I can't answer any of them, but so, yeah, go uh, ahead. Front row. What was all of your guys' first convention that you went to? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Comic Con San Diego for Yuki Cross Vampire Night. <laughs> Yeah, mine was, I did a small convention in Ohio, Ohio Con. Um, yeah. With a Y. Yes, indeed, with a Y. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience. But yeah, that was my, I forget what year it was. Um, not that long ago, actually. 1992? <laughs> nope, nope. Mine was uh, Anime Crossroads uh, in Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's it was a good one, yeah, it was a lot That's of fun. That's a great question. I've never been asked that question. Yeah, I do. Thank you. You guys, I uh, hate to say it, but the bar's been raised, so yeah. all the questions have to be like super unique. Either that or we just end the panel now. Does that work? Ooh. There we go. We have the technology. Hello, guys. Um, two questions. Um, I just want to know, what, what, what did you know about Fire Emblem before you were casting as your respective characters? And then also, how did your approach engage with the characters you were playing? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I honestly haven't been asked that one either. I didn't know anything about Fire Emblem when I got hired back then. Um, I haven't. I hadn't played games in many, many, many years, so uh, I, I was. I wasn't privy to a lot of the games I was getting hired for. Period. Um, but when I was playing games, I was really into fantasy games. That was kind of my style of, of, of game. Um, and uh, you know we used to play Dungeons and Dragons um, way back, and I, I really was like you know, which is I guess conducive to this business that I'm in. Like I love that kind of whimsical, fantastical experience. Um, I still am that way. I um, I love going to Disneyland all the time. Um, I love waking up in the morning with like this sense of wonder, like a child. You know where life's gonna go, how things are gonna be, what kind of job I'm gonna get hired for. But. Um, yeah, I, um, when I got hired to answer your question, I didn't know anything about Fire Emblem. I found out as I went along. And, um, you know, with these games, the way that they, they work, at least in my experience, you um, you don't get a whole lot up front. You usually show up to the studio and then they provide you with your script on the fly. And they tell you what's going on and um, who your lover interest is and, uh, you know, what's happening. And, you kind of do it all right there on the fly. Um, it's not like you can study a script ahead of time or anything like that. So I just kind of learned as I went and um, discovered the character as I went as well. Um, for Tiki, because I've sort of been in the Fire Emblem world for a while, um, you know, I used to speak a little differently. So I really remembered being young and um, wanting to make friends, and so. That was kind of where I pulled from her. But when I first did her, I don't remember thinking it was an accent because I spoke differently. So when I got spoke together, like, and do that accent you did. And I was like, I did an accent. <laughs> so I, I've now lived in LA for 23 years, but I ended up having to listen and kind of voice match myself because when you live somewhere longer, you just become that thing. Um, but Fire Emblem Engage, you know, getting to play young Tiki, who just wants to be friends with everybody, and also getting to play medium Tiki, <laughs> you know, I would say she's old, and then Naga, the mother. And which almost sounded like Jade from Mortal Kombat. When I started doing it, I was like, wait a minute. Um, and Jade is basically my mother. Um, so, <laughs> now you know all my secrets. Um, it was really cool to play three generations, and not just because of the game, but Fire Emblem and Fate have been my whole adult life as a voice actress. And so I, I've gotten to grow up with these characters and become a better actress. And, and like what Nick is saying, it, we're in a world where even 15 years ago, when we all kind of started, the, the industry keeps changing so quickly that where we are now didn't literally didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody got into TV acting in the 90s, by 1999 it was the same business. We came in in like 2008, you know, and we're now, the games exist now, um, the anime community, um, just the, the prevalence of, of how tight we are worldwide didn't exist. So where we are every morning we're like, hey, and hang out, you guys. This is amazing. Um, it's like being seven permanently, and it's recess. So thank you. Thank you for pirating. Yeah, you know, my story is. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. The short answer is I didn't know much about it. I, um, you know, I was 
into gaming when I was a kid, and then, you know, life happened, and I kind of let that go. And then I started auditioning for more video games. And when, when lockdown happened, um, I was like, I'm buying a Switch, and I'm gonna buy, I already had an Xbox, and I was like, and I had a PS4. So I, I just went crazy, and I was like, you know what, all right, I'm gonna schedule time to play again, because some of it was, I was auditioning for stuff, and you know, my training was always like, you know, if you're auditioning for like a three camera comedy versus a one camera comedy, you know, on camera wise, you need to know the style of what you're auditioning for, so that you don't lay down the tape of something that's just, you know, you know, a one hour drama when it's supposed to be, you know, Arrested Development. Um, so I was like, you know, what? I need to know a little. I need to get back, jump back into the gaming world, just to know what I'm, what I'm doing. So I jumped back in with Zelda, with Breath of the Wild, and went crazy. But anyway, so I didn't. So I knew of Fire Emblem. I knew what it was. I knew what it meant, you know. Um, but it wasn't something that I had played. Um, and then when I got the audition, it was of course exciting. And um, yeah, I still have yet. To, I like it's on my list to. I'm currently going back and playing the Uncharted series right oh, now. Yeah, um, I'm in three, and so anyway, those are that's my like that the last I love that stuff so much, but it's on my list, and I can't wait I can't wait to play it because I have people tell tell me about you know oh, I love the supports of this and I love that and so anyway yeah I still don't know uh, uh, I'm probably no less than anyone else in this room. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm here. What's the next question? You guys have a great question. Hello. So there are like 700 or more Fire Emblem characters. <laughs> do, do any of you guys have a favorite underrated character? If you know, if you know enough of them. I I'll let you guys answer that. I don't. <laughs> no, because all my friends don't play underrated characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, have you ever cast Erica Lindbeck in an underrated character? That doesn't exist. But that's a good, yeah. I mean, I've... Can I turn it back on you? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. Do you have a, Do you have favorite underrated characters? Please. Uh, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, you're putting me on. No, I'm just kidding. I, I like Luth Deer and Echoes. He's cool. Cool. Oh, cool. Okay. 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 Yeah. Everybody's like, that's going deep, deep cut. One of the great things about Patrick too was in those directing set in those sessions, he's so economical with his speech. So like he can paint you the world and he gave me even not knowing right mm -hmm. and you know as was said before you don't have any prep you know um you're going to in. Keep it secret yeah for that and it is a director's medium i'm glad it, that you brought that i up. always say that because i want them to get i mean it's, it is like without that collaboration at the top of the session and throughout you create the voice collaborative collaboratively um so yeah yeah um We'd be just all willy nilly in there. We'd yeah. <laughs> we probably wouldn't be in there at all. <laughs> and who's next? There we go. Must get stronger. So I swear to God, I have a question. Okay. Um, but I would just like to. I'm something of a voice actor myself, and actually, um, we're co-stars. All, all three of you. Um, I'm a remote voice actor. I live right outside of Springfield, and in 2022, I had the phenomenal opportunity to voice the character Malara in uh, Fire Emblem Heroes. Nice. So it is a absolute privilege, an absolute privilege to um, listen in on this panel and hear about your phenomenal experiences. And so, um, I guess as something of a actor. Um, Kind of on the rise a little bit. When did you guys know um, that you could make a living out, out of this? <laughs> yeah. Yesterday. It's so strange. We, we're our own glass ceiling. I think you're so close, you know, to the job. Sometimes you, you you know people that work more than you, and so just recently, like when they like lay out our pictures on the table, I was like, well, dang, I think we've done a few things, Nick. You're yeah. so. You always want to be better. Everyone, there's so many people that are just as talented or more talented than you. Um, I was in a car accident eight years ago, and my SAG insurance paid for everything. And when I woke up, um, 
from from just it was a bad car accident. But Bang Zoom, the producers from Bang Zoom Entertainment were in the room. And I was like, why would I want to go to law school? My life, like these are producers, like they came. Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt were there, Jason um, Charles Miller, uh, the Bang Zoom people, my, my sound supervisor from Breaking Bad. I felt like Dorothy was like, and you were there? And you were there? <laughs> and it just suddenly occurred to me that it wasn't about the money, but that why would I want a different life than the extraordinary life that brought these people into a room that I was in? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting the way you phrased that question of, of when did you know that you could make a living doing this, I think you said, or, yeah, and it's, it's you know, everybody's definition of success and of, of making it or whatever is, is different, you know, and I think for all of us it changes over time, you know, I, I, I someone asked me once, like, you know, what do you do what, what, what have you done in the downtimes when it felt like nothing was going right and you weren't booking stuff? And my only answer was that there was some engine in me that still believed in my journey in some way. And I couldn't really explain it to anybody more than that. Um, because because when I was asked that, I would, and I, I, this is not exactly what you asked, but I was at, I thought to myself, why, you know, what did keep me going, you know? I've had friends who have moved on to other careers, they're very successful, and, and I will say to them, like, can you believe I'm still doing this? And they're like, yeah, you're, you're doing it until you don't do it, you know? Um, but yeah, I think it's a constant. I think as artists to, you know, and I can't speak for everybody, but I, I, I have trouble being satisfied with all of it. I can, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to be grateful for it and to have had a body of work and I keep getting to work with great people and new opportunities. I love what you said about waking up and you know, what's the new thing that's gonna happen, you know? And so, I, yeah, I, uh, I it, it, it's hard to know because like even where you are now and you go, all right, well, what's the next one, you know, how's it gonna be, is it exciting? I don't know, that's kind of an all over hodgepodge answer, but that's what I was inspired to say. May I ask your name? Uh, Kevin Irvin. Kevin Irvin, you guys. Well, in sure. 2019, one of the most popular questions would be, like, how do you become a voice actor? But people would say, can you be a voice actor if you don't live in New York, LA, London, like the major cities? And I would say, well, the technology exists now. But give it like two to three years for the producers to realize that it's that easy. I, I didn't I didn't cause the pandemic. I just, <laughs> you know, as me. Um, but Kevin is a perfect example that within two years of me saying that, like every producer on the planet realized you don't have to live in LA if you are. You can be in Springfield, right? Yes. And so right now, there may be a situation where you're like, well, how could I pursue my dream? Because right now I have to have three jobs, or I live in a small town, or taking care of my family. Or, you know, there's no non-binary people. You know, whatever it is, I mean, if you don't see it in the industry, it means that you get to be it in the industry. Okay? So don't don't think that because you don't see the way now that it's not going to exist. It could be minutes or months. You could be that close to an opportunity that makes room for exactly who you are, how you are, and what you are. Thank you for speaking up. And we'd like to talk to you after. Thank you so much. Yes. So, uh, what's the what's it like voicing both young and old TV? Is there like is it hard or is it is there any unique something anything unique about voicing two different versions of the same character? Um, I think that can be, but age is like um, it's like a wardrobe change to be honest. So it's the same person. So I could be like a really young person that sounds like this and she's five, and then I could be a really young person that sounds like this but she's eight, and then I could be that same person who's 10 or 11 or 12 who's a little bit more thoughtful, and then I could be her at 14 that's just frustrated, and then I could be her at 19 who is trying to impress the professors, and then I could be her in the 20s who has a job, and then I could be her in her 40s 
and my 50s or 60s, or I can be the same person and be 80 and still feel like a little girl inside, but my voice is just, it's, it's, it's a change out of wardrobe, but I still feel like that little girl inside, right? And so, I think if you're trying to manipulate your voice, it's a little different than your point of view. And I remember moving 26 times before I was 21, so I was always the new kid trying to catch up, and I felt bad in young teeth. And she genuinely wanted to make friends and was a little bit scary, just like you are. You're the new kid, you're different, you talk different. Um, I liked you know, being older TV as well, but that was the first one. Um, but I, I just really appreciate uh, the director, again, because they give you the perspective of where you're at, where you've been. And so I wasn't thinking that necessarily at the time of this different character. But when you have a great director, they give you that point of view that naturally adjusts your, your, your characterization. I just love TV. She's so... Obviously, I was born to play TVs. I play like three of them. <laughs> it was in my destiny. Yeah. Thank you. What a great question. What characters would you like to voice? Octane. <laughs> so There's always somebody who wants your job more. Whatever the next awesome, amazing character is in the next amazing video game. Honestly, yeah, legacy yeah. games. Like you never know that we didn't know Apex was gonna be Apex or yeah. Fire Emblem was gonna be Fire Emblem. There's there's and nobody that tells you're gonna get a job and be playing it twelve years later. I remember talking to I forget one of the guys in Red Dead. And he was like, yeah, the audition, this, we know this, but like the audition came in, untitled video game. Like, sometimes you, you don't know, this could be the smallest, you know, self-produced indie game, or it could be, and it, maybe it starts that way, you know, who knows, but it could be anything. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the, like, whatever the next unknown thing is that comes across my own. Jay from Mortal Kombat was guard A. And I was like, I really wanted to be in a Warner Brothers game. And I was like, listen, if I have to go in as guard A, that's at least my foot's in the door. Yeah. And so then my agent was like, you booked guard A. And I just have to sign a bunch of NDAs. So I was like, I booked guard A in a big ass game. And then they sent it over and I was looking through 306 pages of a script. Like the, the script was like, how many different endings? There was no guard A anywhere in the script. <laughs> And I called my agent, and he was like, Mella, it says Jade right across the front. In my brain, Jade was the code name for this really fancy game. Sure. <laughs> and then I cried. Like, I was like, did I just boot? Because the audition was guard A. There were three or four lines. There was no callback. I looked to Jade from one page of untitled Warner Brothers. Yeah. I've always wanted to, to uh, if the day gets made, I always wanted to voice Daredevil. Mm. So we'll see if that comes out. Oh, dude, that's, that's awesome. Great. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. awesome. I used to have a lot of Daredevil comics. I don't know what the hell happened to them. They, do they have Is awesome there, movies? there isn't a game? There, no. Or, Not that I know of. Yeah, I don't think there is. No. That's Not crazy right. that there isn't. Not the one starring Nicholas. Yeah. Um, and you guys out there decide to make that game one day. Yeah, right. Me up. I'll be ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be guard A. <laughs> I'll be guard B. I'll be guard C. <laughs> Alright, so before I get my question, uh, I want to say shout outs to Kevin. And because see you back there, by the way. I was there for his panel last year where he was giving advice to uh, like people who were looking to sort of get into the voice acting industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so you brought up a lot of interesting stuff in that panel, but I wanted to sort of ask you guys uh, what advice would you give to? You know, aspiring voice actors who are looking to get into the industry. Oh, there's so much. Um, God, I, you know, I mean, well, there's, there's, there's technical advice. You know, there's like business-based advice, which is, you know, uh, taking classes not just because to practice your instrument and train your instrument, but also because. You make connections that way. You meet directors. You meet other actors who are going to be a director. You meet, uh, you know, that's the way you really continue to 
get jobs. So there's business advice like that. Awesome, thank you. And then there's there's like more ethereal kind of artistic advice, and that that's the that's kind of what I, I was speaking to before. It's just like you know having a belief in yourself, even if it's uh, just a small thing, and even if it takes a beating. Just believing somewhere that you know this is what I'm, I'm, I'm doing this like I'm supposed to do this, um, and and continuing with that, uh, yeah. And then the, I think the a process of questioning yourself is good too. I think it gets uh, a bad rap, but saying like you know, am I am I progressing? Am I am I? What is there a goal that would help me get to this other goal? Um, and asking yourself. Am I still doing this for the right reasons? Am I so anyway? Those are more out there kind of woo-woo things. But to me, it's just it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And if you just do something every day, even if it's a small thing that makes you feel like I'm moving myself forward, then you you can't miss. You just have to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um. You know, you definitely don't want to be um, focused on fast tracking anything. Um, the focus should be like, I love doing this. I'd be willing to do it for ten years without getting paid. And if you could, you know, answer that question and say yes, I would do it for ten years without getting paid, then you're probably meant to be in the business. You know. Um, but uh, you know, my number you asked number one. I would just just the first thing that jumped in my head is like just get a solid theater background or acting background. Period. First. Whether that's a two-year program, a one-year program, a four-year program, whatever you can do, whatever's in your area, or whatever uh, point of life you're in. If you're in college right now, jump into some theater classes. Because the first thing you're going to need um, when it really comes down to it is tools in your home. Um, and if there's no tools from the start, you got nothing. You got nothing anyway. So get the real tools in your belt first, and, and you got to put yourself in a position where you can perform in front of you. So if that comes with theater, that comes with other acting classes, or you might be on, on camera classes, or you're in a room with 14 other people and you perform scenes in front of each other or whatever, you gotta be in the hot seat. Um, you're gonna be in the hot seat your whole career. There's always gonna be people on top of you that are, that are directing you, judging you, uh, writers that are asking you to do things, and you gotta be able to do it. Making uh, changes on the fly, you gotta be able to do it uh, in front of people. Not worried about how you sound, not worried about who's watching, not worried about who's listening. All that stuff matters when, when you're actually performing. But like he said, and then he nailed it, there's the business side of it too. That's a whole other realm of like, what to do to get in the voice acting. It's like, and that's a whole other hour long conversation um, of things that you gotta do, you know, to, to be able to get in. But um, the gist of it is, you will find your way once you get that solid acting background. Because through that process, you're gonna be studying like, you're gonna be meeting people, like I said. You're gonna be um, uh, networking. You're gonna be finding out like little jobs to get or, or college projects that are happening or whatever. And then that's gonna form uh, you kind of like sniffing around as to like you know how to get your first opportunities in voice acting and websites you can start submitting auditions on, um, things like that. But but the main the main base is to just get right in and get your feet wet acting, um, and then. Like you said, it, it really is a marathon. It really is. Um, but if you want to do it, you will do it. You will do it. You'll find a way. And education, I'm the patron saint of late bloomers and what the, you know, like did you right? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to speak to the rest of you guys who don't have four years to go to college. Uh, anybody know who Will Coulter is? Okay, Will Coulter is now Adam Warlock in the new Marvel movie. Um, but when he was 12, uh, he wasn't very good at school. He comes from a family of doctors, like scientists, medical professionals. Um, was horrible at math, biology. Like it was clear that early on that he was not going to be like the rest. Um, but he was kind of funny, and so he took a drama class. So maybe your drama class is just in. in, in primary school, middle school, junior high. It could be an improv class in your local town. Um, so you have to take a class to start to get comfortable with yourself. But Will got an audition for a film called Son of Rambo at W um, and crushed it. Ended up after Son of Rambo doing The Chronicles of Narnia. After that, he was in We're the Millers. And you know, 
didn't really have a lot. Uh, he ended up being in The Revenant with Leo DiCaprio and a few other people. He's now in the Marvel Universe. He's a phenomenal actor and didn't have a four-year degree. He's just been working. But he knew who he was and he had a family that really supported him and he was different. And my advice as an instructor is you have to know who you are. Because before you step into a class at a, at a strip mall, or like I did, I stepped into a class in a college and had a professor tell me, um, being mixed race and kind of how you're drawn, there's really no work for you. You're not enough of anything to be successful in the entertainment industry. You should find something else to do. And I listened. Okay? Because I didn't own who I was. That line needs to go down. He got fired later. So um, so <laughs> <laughs> All right? So I want you to make your list. When you go home, whether you want to be an actor or voice actor or anything, I want you to make a list of your top ten influentials, the people that have hurt you the most, the people that have loved you the most, the people that have inspired you the most. Uh, they could be beings also, because like for me, Repo, one of my dogs, like was always had my back. This is who you are in a scene right away or who you are speaking to. So if you have to have a shorthand and you're like son of Rambo, you're 12 years old, you're about to get your big break, you have to know who you are. And then your love list, the top 10 things that you love. Not like, not sunsets and maybe potatoes. I mean uh, midnight, uh, midnight blue at 2 a.m. when you can see the stars when you're outside in, in Rio de Janeiro, New Mexico. I mean like be really specific. What lights your heart on fire? What do you love? I love quantum mechanics. I, I love quantum physics. I love alternate universe theory. When I was 12, nobody did, but now it's everybody's thing, right? Know who you are and what you love. Those are the things that are going to create characters in a moment. You, if you know that right now, tomorrow you could have an opportunity. And if you know who you are and all you have is to bring who you are. If you're Kellen Goff and you're slightly autistic, well, there's room for that. Ten years ago, nobody thought that was possible. Kellen's doing okay, right? Know what you love and who you are. And you are made up of your ten influentials. Those people that loved you, believed you, those people like Grand Assassin felt sorry to say real name, that tore you down and made you feel like you were nothing. Know who you are, because before you walk into a class or anything, I want you to know that you are not here on this planet to erase yourself and become something you're not. Nerves are a symptom of amnesia. It means you forgot who you are. Do you hear me? So whether you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a voice actor, I want you to know who you are, that you're allowed to take up space, you're allowed to have anxiety, you're allowed to be different than everyone else, love somebody else, you don't have to please everybody, you don't, you're, you're not vanilla. You're not here to be everything and all things to all people. That's what we call uh, hotel carpeting and hotel art. Okay? Right? Before you go to college, before you go to your improv class, before you take an online course, uh, before you go to your next convention and ask another question, own your power. And your power is your story and your narrative and, and, and what you've gone through. Raise your hand, anybody in here who's had a heartbreak like that tore you apart. Okay? That's the depth of your acting. That's the depth of what you bring as an accountant, as a costumier, as, as a graphic novelist, as a voice actor. And once you own that, take that to whatever you can, whether it's a, a free class online after Mel's birthday, or you're with Steve Lewis class, whatever it is, but know that when you walk in there, you're just learning how to use who you are and what you are in this world. Okay? Sorry to be so passionate, but like I don't want you to think that, you know, like you can be in Springfield, Connecticut and, and you, your, your destiny will make room for you. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm passionate about it. No. I just want to say to that too is staying curious about that. Because you can't sometimes know all the things all at once. And as long as you stay curious to asking those questions, then you, no matter what experience you're in, you can learn, you can get something from that experience. Maybe it answers one of those things about who you feel you are, or it solidifies something. And, and the idea of foundational training too, it just, uh, there's a lot of people that I talk to that I, I will, they'll say, I want to be a voice actor, and, how to, and, and then I'll say, well, um, have you done any acting? 
and they'll go, oh no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it's like, it. yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. I mean, I had not done any voice acting at all when I got my first job. It was a lead role, two, two seasons, 50 episodes. I didn't know what it meant to be anime, voicing an anime, I had no idea. But I had a foundation, I did know to, to Miles more, I did know who I was as an actor. I did believe in myself as an actor. And I thought, okay, well, yeah, I'll probably fumble a bit, but I could pick this up. And, you know, I still listen to those first six apps, and I'm like, oh my god, it's terrible. But, you know, um, uh, yeah. Which lets you know you don't have to be great to make it. If we all thought we had to be the best, like, I look back at some that's such a great point. You're like, oh, man. Can I, can I re record those now? <laughs> oh, we've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. I need a do-over on that one. Yeah. But I still have people come up to me on those things that I was nervous about, that I think I wish I'd done better, and they're crying, saying, this helped me get through my mom's death or something. And you're that's like, the oh, thing. so you can be not what you think is your best self and still change somebody's world? Okay, you're allowed to make mistakes, discover, and grow. You, you don't have to be the perfect version of yourself 10 years from now. You just have to be you now. What are we, I just want to ask, are we, was this a, is this a 45 minute, how much, 545, we have 11 minutes. Okay, oh. any more questions? There's one in the very back, actually, Woo! Uh, that I promised I see you. Yeah, that's you, that's you. Oh. Yep. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have a question myself, and it's adding on to the voice acting. So first off, um, I already said who I am, I'm an artist, but I'm also taking an interest in voice acting. So I want to ask this um, were there any challenges that you experienced as voice actors, and if so, um, how did you overcome them? Mm. So many. Oh, God. Yeah. No, finances, food, uh, I brought my Tupperware. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, uh, for, I guess early on, you know, um, for me, I, I just remember it seemed really hard to break into American animation. It seemed really, really tough, you know, to figure it out. And it, it honestly was because of my inexperience at the time. I, I, I had a lot of acting chops from, from all my studies, but like you were talking about earlier, the nuances of, of voiceover. There's many nuances. You gotta know what you're reading for. You gotta know what the energy is of these different projects. And um, you can't just like not do your research when you're when you're auditioning for, you know, you're auditioning for a DreamWorks series and you've only worked on anime, you know, for the last couple of years, you can't expect that you're going to know what you're doing. So, um, watch animation. So yeah, Game. that's exactly <laughs> what I had to learn, was to start doing real homework. And um, I learned that, um, thank, thank God, sooner than later. But I remember thinking back and going like, I probably blew a few years of wasted auditions because I didn't really know what I was doing when it came to reading for these Disney series, these DreamWorks series. And then, again, it's part of the process, part of figuring things out in life, part, part of the journey of acting. Um, and then I started doing my homework, and sure enough, you know, those jobs started coming. So for me, yeah, that was one of the major major troubles or difficulties uh, early on. Interesting that you bring that up, because that's about, you already had the gift, you already had the talent, but it's filtering it through the right sort of lens, you know? And then, right. and you gotta learn what that lens is. It's similar to just, going back into gaming and like, you know, watching cutscenes and being like, oh, okay, yeah, I know what this is now. Like, mine, mine is a bit more, um, uh, yeah, so I think that as artists, there's this idea, and it's, it's true in many cases, I don't want to generalize, but that we can be hard on ourselves or that we can uh, get in our head quite a bit or, um, you know, get stuck in your head or beat yourself up a bit for a, a whatever it is, right? So I think, um, you know, Nick was talking about being in the hot seat, you know, and you are, when you're in front of a microphone, you, in uh, many times, in an hour, two hours, you're asked to create a character and solidify that voice and, 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 and bring the goods, you know, right there. There's no like, okay, this is a dress rehearsal or anything like that, right? So I, I, I had a session, it was a, a big commercial session, and it was, a, I think about it all the time because it was a lesson for me about how to bring myself back from the brink of like, you know, just meltdown in a way. I was in, uh, I forget where I was, 
Um, but the client was in Florida. There were clients uh, somewhere on the West Coast. Uh, and it was like Universal, Orlando Resort, Coca-Cola, Wendy's, like a lot of clients on the line, right? And then you've got the director of the spot and the advertising executive. Anyway, long story short, I was just getting a lot of direction and I couldn't seem to filter the right read for each for what each client wanted. You know, they wanted Jimmy Fallon's name said a different way, or can you bring up Coca-Cola a bit? Or you know, and it was like and it was like I was going into my head of like, oh my God, I can't do that. I, I can't do it. I don't know what they want. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I was starting to spiral. And when you're it's the loneliest place in the world, especially with earphones on and or you can hear your own breath and you're like, I was yeah. you know and I'll be right there. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Where were, I've, I've got the right now. <laughs> I know. And it's like, and you know, and then the director comes back in and they're like, okay, so good. Yeah, let's do it again. And you're like, they, the direct, I'm just stressing out the writer and the direct, anyway. So I had to really, in that moment, go, no, you, you know what you're doing. You're, you've done this before. You have what it takes to do this. They hired you for this job just breathe, relax, and I was able to pull myself back and do it. So, I don't even remember what the question was now, but, um, yeah, so that that thing of getting, of, of being your own worst enemy or sabotaging yourself right before the miracle happens, or whether it's an audition or a, a job, to be able to know that you can help yourself and bring yourself out of it, because no one else was gonna help me, you know what I mean? Um, Anyway, that's that's a, a lesson that I, I hold on to because that can happen that's anytime. Great. And that's gonna happen to anybody. That's gonna happen to anybody getting into this. You're gonna run into one of those scenarios just like that. Like that's why me oh, and Bella were yeah, both relating to it immediately. I had a client once and I got hired to be uh, a Massachusetts like New England docent. And then when I got to the callback, they said we actually prefer a British. And I was like, well, I can do that. You know, <laughs> And then I booked the job, and they're like, so we were talking amongst ourselves, and we were thinking maybe more of a Universal Studios tour guide. And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? And so I started doing it, and then they're like, or, or what about a Southwest airline stewardess that's like Barbie? And I mean, I was like, Ugh. like I'm like, and it was like, and then they were changing orders, and I mean. I had, my first commercial, I did like three takes, I made 3,500 bucks, and I walked out the door, I was like, this is amazing. We're on take 68. <laughs> and they said, you know what, um, yeah, can you just take a break? We're gonna talk for a minute amongst ourselves. And I'm like, I'm new in the industry, this has never happened to me. I don't know what they want. It's like, ladies and gentlemen, we are, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are, ladies and gentlemen, TA, all, okay. and I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then like 30 minutes go by, I walked back in, and they're like, um, apparently legal says we can't change our initial wording, so um, the first six takes were great. Can we just play those for you, and you can just do a few more just like that, okay? Dude, and like, the lesson, the lesson there, which is exactly, is that they didn't know what they wanted, but you could have let that, you know, get in your head and just take you down, and yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, it, that's, it it's, oh yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, it, it's, a lot of times we forget. I did a job, um, I was playing, I was supposed to be this kind of, the voice of the dog in this like real estate commercial oh, where the dog, that. you know, yeah, the dog, runs into the house first after the, the the new owners you know open the house and you know and dude I couldn't do I literally they they actually recast me like so there's that <laughs> they just, and I was like you hired me to do this dog this is my dog and I, I, I did like four different versions of what that would sound like based on the different pictures of dogs that they were showing me and I didn't know this that happened. I was doing this happened. Right, this happened. Guys. So also thick skin of like because I could still if I wanted to go. I wonder what I just couldn't get about that. That they had to, you know, the director of the spot. There was the director, and then there was the client, who was you know the advertising executive and the people. They cast the director. The director who was a friend of mine. I left. They paid me because they had to pay me for my time, 
and he went in and recorded the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you do it so good, you just do it. Yeah, yeah. He's like, because he would, he would, you know how it goes yes. silent? Yes. And they were like, we want it like this, and he would do it. And after I left, they were like, well, we kind of like what you were doing, so why don't you just do it? Yeah. They didn't pay him, though. This is the, you guys are getting the tea right now. You're getting the tea. Awesome. We have Let's take minutes. one more question. One more question. Right. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, we have, we have three hands. Oh, you raise uh, your We have a front row, a mid row, and a yellow. Whose birthday is in February? That would be me. Okay, you pick who. No, look, look. Wait a minute. Octane? <laughs> okay. Oh, Octane. Uh, whose birthday of the three people was in June? Oh! oh. Hey! hey. You, you, are you guys going to be back here? Are you leaving? Are you going to be back at your table? Oh, After this. Oh, okay. But, oh, but Octane. Oh, okay. Yeah, if, okay, you, if you didn't get your question yeah. answered, come, come talk to us. Yeah, yeah we'll be at our table. Um, so this is more like a general question. What is your more like most like wild or like most interesting or happiest like convention interaction that you've ever had? Oh heavens! Sydney nude or, or prison? We got to hold a koala. Oh yeah! <laughs> yes, oh, that was an adventure. Major. Yeah, it's the best. Yeah, I was petting kangaroos. I ain't scared of no kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, people were asking me when I came back, like, man, you can't get by near those kangaroos. You gotta be. I was like, I went right up to them kangaroos. Right? Dude, we went after like, oh, like, dude, a whole that's amazing. school bus, and they were like fed this field of kangaroos. Yeah. They were literally on their backs, like so overfed that they were like. They were like big oh. beer belly beach whales. Like this so one there. of them, he just put the food, and the guy was like rolled over this kangaroo, and he was like. Okay. <laughs> He's like, take the picture, Mel, and, the, and the, he took like one bite, and then he just was like, I'm done, I'm toast, I'm toast. <laughs> and then they, they like, hand, they like the way they do the koala stuff. There's like a handler, and you, you're in line, and you, you finally get up to the handler, and she's holding this stinky koala, <laughs> and then she's like, okay, like, don't have your chain on, take your chain off, take your watch off. Okay, I'm gonna just, you just accept him when I hand him over, and so you just kind of like. This stinky koala is just up on you, and he's like grabbing your shirt and everything. And then they casually say this, and don't put your finger in their butt. They have chlamydia on oh, And I was like, so weird. Where are you supposed to hold it? Like, oh shit! I would have been like, and Bella was the one that set that up so that we would hold koalas. <laughs> they, wait, they get chlamydia, chlamydia yes, a lot. They do. It's, so weird. That's, it's not that they just are prone to it; they get it a lot. Like, so, and, 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 Signed us up for this, huh? Okay. I could have just looked at the qual. I'd have been fine with it. Yeah, I, can't. I mean, I think the best part, like I know you'll have one, but no, is no, that no. we get to we're friends, but we don't get to always be in the booth at the same time. So because of your magic and you ask us, we get to go on okay, this is our job. We get to go on a vacation with our castmates all over the world and meet you guys and like it's just being here is the freaking best. If I knew in my sad raw doll childhood that I was gonna yeah. just get the golden ticket and we would get to hang out and chat and laugh about the things that broke our hearts when we got recast. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think that was gonna happen, guys? This is the moral of the story is if you hang in there long enough because you love it enough, whether it's ten years, fifteen years later, you will find that spot, that that like dream place that you were hoping to get to. It's worth the wait. You'll find it. I'll say this, I, you know, there's no way to choose like a favorite experience. I think listening to, you know, those are the things that stick out. But I, I will say that, you know, I, I've had to redefine like what what is it, you know, when I was a young actor uh, coming up and... Yesterday. Yeah, yes, right, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, last weekend. Um, I, but, you know, I knew I had the engine, I had the drive, but I couldn't really give you a good, uh, articulate why. Um, and in my, you know, later years, no, um, this idea of like being a part of something that has an impact, um, like that's the dream, you know? And for me, you know, I fell in love with theater. I've done some on camera stuff. It doesn't matter what medium it is. Um, to, to be a part of something that has an impact on somebody. One person, a handful of people, a lot, whatever. And that's what I'm continually reminded of when I come to conventions. And so that's my sort of blanket answer. 
is that that's the best interaction of like, oh, and it could be a popular show that I'm in, or something that, you know, I literally bring five prints to each convention for, because oh, I'm only gonna get off asked about it once. But knowing, just having that interaction with you guys about how this impacted you, or what it was about, is like, it's the greatest gift, so, anyway. Thanks. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, give everybody a round of applause. Thank you. Can table? Can you guys real quick? Group home. Hi, Tasha Valenza, aka Poison Ivy, and you've just been watching King's Entertainment Reviews. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and watch.